This presentation is about Fort Cumberland in Maryland and how it changed over time. I will show many excerpts from old documents. Although you won't have time to read all the text, the most important parts are highlighted in red. The image shown here is a fanciful drawing that was included in Loudermilk's 1878 book about the history of Cumberland. The actual terrain looks nothing like this. The fort structure only looked like this for a short period of time. This presentation is primarily based on material from my 2019 book, Fort Cumberland. The book is available in a two volume print format from various online booksellers. It is also available in Kindle format from Amazon. All proceeds benefit the Allegheny County Historical Society. Before we dig into the Fort Cumberland topic, I'll touch briefly on the backstory. I'll start the backstory with two Indian villages. One village was named Pickawillany. It was located about 29 miles north of where Dayton, Ohio is today. The other village was Logstown. It was across the river from Aliquippa. Both villages had British trading posts. The French attacked Pickawillany in 1752 to knock out its trading post. They also started building a chain of forts. The attack on Pickawillany angered the Logstown Indians. The Indians declared war against the French and asked the Brits for a fort where Pittsburgh is today. The Brits started building the fort, but were evicted at gunpoint by the French. About the same time, the French attacked Logstown. George Washington heard the news on his way to help build the new fort. He changed plans and started towards Redstone. That's where Brownsville is. He thought they could launch an attack from there. A Logstown Indian sent word that French forces were on the move against Washington. Washington joined forces with the Logstown Indians and destroyed a small French contingent. That was the affair at Jamonville Glen. Washington retreated and built Fort Necessity. The French attacked and Washington capitulated. He and most of his army were paroled. France built Fort Duquesne at the site of present day Pittsburgh and the Brits made plans to kick them out. Part of their plan was erecting a fort at the mouth of Wills Creek to serve as a launching point for an expedition against Fort Duquesne. The new fort eventually became known as Fort Cumberland. That's the backstory. Now we're going to learn about the fort. It all started with a letter Robert Dinwiddie wrote to James Innes. Dinwiddie was the governor of Virginia. Innes was a North Carolina colonel. Dinwiddie wanted a new fort and warehouses at Wills Creek. He wanted to use a fort as a launch pad for a campaign against the French. The Ohio Company already had their new store at Wills Creek. It was on the hill across the river from the site of the fort. This is how it looked in 1755. William Trent and Christopher Gist had houses nearby. Notice the cart parked on the path that runs down to the Potomac River. The Ohio Company transported their trade goods to the new store by boat. The mouth of Wills Creek was considered to be the highest navigable point on the river. This is the historical marker for the new store. It's near the Blue Bridge in Ridgely, West Virginia. The original new store was actually up on the hill, not here. Dinwiddie told Ennis to use the Ohio Company swivel guns and storehouse. He also told Ennis to get his cannons moved to Wills Creek. Here's what a swivel looks like. They were used with canister shot, which was called partridge shot back then. George Krogan was the main Indian trader at Pickawillany. On August 16th, he wrote that Ennis was going to join the independent companies at Wills Creek and build a fort. 
In other words, the fort wasn't started yet on August 16th. An early use of the name Fort Cumberland appears in an April 17, 1755 magazine article. It says the independent companies reached Wills Creek on September 1st, 1754. Remember that date, September 1st. Dinwiddie wrote this to Governor Sharp of Maryland. It states, I have ordered Colonel Innes to take possession of the Ohio Company's warehouse, which will make a very good magazine, and have directed a breastwork and the great guns to be mounted for defense. And if they can build a shed around it, may be proper for the soldiers to lodge in. Colonel Innes wrote this from Wills Creek on September 27th. I have erected a puncheon fort. What does this mean? A puncheon is a heavy slab or a split log. Fort Cumberland wasn't built from telephone pole sized logs stuck in the ground. Where does one get telephone pole sized logs in a virgin forest? Fort Cumberland was made from split logs. This isn't the only document that says so. Look at that date. September 27th. The basic fort was a quickie job, built in just 27 days. Granted, there was more work to be done, but the basic fort was complete. George Krogan wrote this on October 16th. Colonel Innes has built a fortification at the mouth of Wills Creek opposite to the new store called Fort Mount Pleasant. This clearly indicates the fort was already built and named by October 16th. Be careful with this letter because the date in the Pennsylvania Archives is wrong. This letter was written on November 21st. It states, We now have got a fort completed, with barracks for our men at the back of it, well built. The letter also says the governor arrived there on November 18th. Governor Sharp wrote the text that is shown here. A small stockade fort was complete when he visited. The barracks were still under construction. The size of the fort did not exceed 120 feet. The last highlighted sentence suggests that the fort had no storehouses or powder magazines. Sharp said the fort was commanded by elevated ground. If the enemy put a cannon on that hill, they could breach the fort. Sharp wanted to build another fort on the hill. That never happened. Eventually, the British did put defensive works on the hill. Ultimately, the fort was radically altered due to the threat that was posed by the hill. The large dot on this topographical map shows the location of Fort Cumberland. The small dot shows the hill everyone was worried about. It's 31 feet higher than the ground at the fort. The hill is about 220 yards northwest of the fort. That is really close range for a cannon. I can't miss proposition. A cannon could turn the fort into splinters from that hill. Those splinters were deadly and could cause a lot of casualties. Wooden stockades are no match for even a small cannon. The elevated ground was perfect. It was relatively safe from musket fire, but inside easy cannon range. Fort Cumberland was built in the wrong place. This is a view from the hill, looking down at the site of Fort Cumberland. The red lines that are just above the center of this picture represent the approximate location of the fort. Sharp described his 1754 visit to Fort Cumberland in this April 19, 1755 letter. He said the fort was still under construction during his visit. At first, this doesn't make any sense. After all, his December 10, 1754 letter said they had completed the small staccato fort. Here's the deal. Although the stockade fort may have been complete on December 10th, there was still a lot of work to do. 
things like building storehouses and a powder magazine. In January of 1755, Sir John St. Clair volunteered to go to Wills Creek to supervise additional barracks construction. Dinwiddie wanted Maryland to provide the labor. Dinwiddie wanted 600,000 pounds of flour delivered to Wills Creek. That's 300 tons of flour requiring somewhere between 300 and 400 wagon loads. That's a lot of flour. Naturally, it wouldn't all be delivered at once. Nevertheless, this should influence your thoughts about the size of the warehouses at Fort Cumberland. Imagine filling a box six feet deep with that much flour. If the box measured 20 feet front to back, it would have to be 50 and a half yards long. These guys were thinking big. Dinwiddie wrote this to Colonel Innes on January 15, 1755. Dinwiddie wanted corn planted on a considerable quantity of land around the fort. Did you ever picture extensive cornfields at Fort Cumberland? If the corn was ever planted, I expect they maintained a clear field of fire near the fort. Dinwiddie wrote this on January 20th. 1755. Virginia forces were still at the new fort building barracks. A small platform was built on the hill northwest of the fort for mounting cannons. At the very least, I believe such a platform would have had log walls to protect the cannoneers from musket fire. St. Clair wrote a letter on February 9, 1755 that mentions the governor's visit to Wills Creek. The letter mentions the fort, or more properly, a small piece of ground enclosed with a strong palisade joined pretty close. The letter also states, there are a number of trees cut down for erecting log houses, and I gave directions for palisading a house near the fort for a powder magazine. Now we are going to take a close look at drawing 38 from series 122 of the King's Maps and Drawings. The drawing is dated February 12, 1755. North is oriented toward the top. The fort is illustrated in the northeast corner of the drawing. Barracks are enclosed within a palisade that is attached to the eastern end of the fort. Wills Creek is located east of the fort. The Potomac River is located south of the fort. In addition to Wills Creek, the fort was flanked by two small streams. The northern stream is identified as a stony run and would have made the approach to the fort a little more difficult. Shading highlights the steep banks of the hill the fort was situated on. East of the fort, the drawing states, the bank from here is very steep and about 20 feet perpendicular height. This bank presented an obstacle for the enemy. Unfortunately, it also probably meant the enemy could get close without detection. South of the river, you can see the blockhouse in the new store. A February 10, 1755 letter indicates that all the land within cannon range was cleared on both sides of the river. This included the area on the far side of the new store. This means we can put a bunch of tree stumps in our mental picture of Fort Cumberland. The letter also indicates the intention to mount a strong guard at the new store. This map inscription states that the Virginia troops are here in camp about 120 officers included, February 12, 1755. The use of the word are suggests that the map existed on February 12th. This is the title of drawing 38. It states, a plan of Fort Cumberland on Wills Creek and Potomac River 
with a view of the storehouses belonging to the Ohio Company on the other side of the river. The title is original to the drawing. It is not something an archivist added later. If the map already existed on February 12, that would suggest that the name Fort Cumberland was in use before Braddock arrived at Wills Creek. Braddock was still at sea on February 12. He didn't land in North America until February 20th. This is an excerpt from Drawing 38 that shows the view looking south into Virginia across the Potomac River. The storehouse is on the left. The blockhouse is on the right. Obviously, the new store was not down on the flats near the present day Blue Bridge. Instead, it was a bank building sitting on the hillside. I get a kick out of the ducks in the river, the birds in flight, and the man in the canoe. Uriah Brown's 1816 journal mentions Fort Cumberland. It then states, directly opposite this fort, over the river in Virginia, Hampshire County, within the shoe or in the bend of the river, on a high eminence, was erected another fort which had good command of the river up and down. Where this fort was, now stands a large and spacious brick dwelling. The brick dwelling was Calm's Mansion, which was built circa 1794. This is a photograph of the Calm's Mansion. Uriah Brown indicated that one of the Ohio Company structures was located at the site of the mansion. Here is an enlarged view of the blockhouse from Drawing 38. The blockhouse is illustrated as having a pointed roof. Here is an enlargement showing the individual crossing the Potomac River in a canoe. We can even see the style of hat he is wearing. This is the description of the fort on drawing 38. It states, this fort is made of puncheons of wood cut 12 foot and set three feet in the ground. There is 10 pieces of cannon mounted in the fort and bastions four pounder and four small swivels. This is the second reference to puncheon construction. The four pounder statement is a reference to cannonball size. This shows the image of the fortification on drawing 38. South is oriented at the top in this view, so you can read the lettering. The fort is on the right and the barracks stockade is on the left. We will zoom in later for a closer look. Here is a quick look at the legend for the preceding image of the fort. It mentions two parade grounds, officers' houses, the powder magazine, storehouses, two guard rooms, and the commanding officer's house. This shows the bastion portion of the Fort Cumberland fortification. This fort structure measured 120 feet across the tips of the bastions, just like Governor Sharp said. The bastions project at the corners of the fort so musket fire can be directed along the curtains. The curtains are the stockade walls between the bastions. The capital letter B in the middle of the fort identifies the fort parade grounds. The lowercase b in the northwest bastion identifies the gunpowder magazine. It was a separate structure that was built inside the bastion. The space between the magazine and the bastion may have been filled with dirt. Dirt is good at stopping projectiles and does not catch fire. Something within this bastion would have provided a surface for supporting the cannons that were mounted inside the bastion. Letter D identifies the commanding officer's house along the eastern curtain. The letter C identifies storehouses on the north and south curtains. The letter E identifies the officer's guard room. 
The letter F identifies another guard room. Together, the two guard rooms are illustrated as forming the western curtain. The main gate is located between the two guard rooms. You can bet your bottom dollar there was some provision for shooting west in order to defend the main gate. This is the illustration of the barracks area on drawing 38. The walls on the outer periphery are partially formed by stockades and partially formed by barracks. The capital letter A identifies the parade grounds. Lowercase a's identify officers' houses. The rest of the barracks are numbered. The pointed southeast end of the barracks area incorporates a pair of water gates. The barracks area also incorporates north and south gates. This is drawing 39. East is at the top. The title of this drawing is A Plan of the Fort and Barracks at Mount Pleasant in Maryland. The date of this drawing is unknown. The only place the name Fort Cumberland appears is in the Archivist inscription. That inscription was probably added by the British Museum. The Grand Parade Ground is identified by three P's at the lower edge of the drawing. Here is a look along the river with north toward the top. One of the Ohio Company structures is illustrated south of the river. A boat is moored along the northern bank of the river. Three canoes are also moored along the river. Three houses are illustrated on the floodplain along the Maryland side of the river. A forked road crosses Wills Creek. South of the fort, the letter L identifies the hospital. Here is an enlargement of the image of an Ohio company structure. It looks like the blockhouse, but it is labeled as being the new store. That is probably a mistake. Check out the big cross on the roof. Here we are zoomed in on the boat that is tied up on the Maryland bank. Before we look at the fort portion of drawing 39, here is a quick look at the legend. It provides a lot more detail compared to drawing 38. Here is the fort with east generally toward the top. The letter A identifies the commanding officer's house. The letter B identifies storehouses for provisions. They each measured 15 by 24 feet. The letter C identifies the sentinel's guard room. And the letter D identifies the officer's guard room. They each measured nine by 23 feet. As with drawing 38, the guard rooms form the western curtain. Check out the pointed double gate between the two guard rooms. It measured nine feet. The gate in the eastern curtain was a sally port. It enters into the barracks stockade. The letter E identifies the magazine. It measured 11 by 13 feet. Each bastion is illustrated with four cannons. They are correctly illustrated as having ship carriages. The cannons are somehow mounted above the powder magazine. The walls of the bastions are illustrated with double line construction. This may represent horizontal log construction rather than puncheon construction. The letter K identifies the commissary's house. Since the commissary is in charge of provisions, I would guess the commissary's house was a storehouse. The letter N identifies the fort parade. It measured 40 by 52 feet. This shows the western part of the barracks stockade on drawing 39. The grand parade is identified with the letter G. East is still at the top of the drawing. The north gate is identified with a two, just east of the northeast bastion. 
The south gate is identified with the letter R and is located just east of the southeast bastion. The north and south gates have double doors that are pointed on top. By being pointed on top, the gates would be harder to climb over. The letter M identifies places of defense for small arms. The letter H identifies officers' quarters. Here is the rest of the barracks area on drawing 39. Check out the canoe that's moored along Wills Creek. The canoe is for high water crossings. The letter M represents places of defense for small arms. As an educated guess, the entire periphery of the barracks stockade was configured for defense. A letter written by a female visitor reveals that the barracks rooms had firing ports. Letters S and T on the east end of the stockade identify water gates. They are illustrated with double doors that have pointed tops. The capital letter I identifies men's barracks. As with drawing 38, the barracks are illustrated as forming the outer walls of the fortification. There were 27 men's barracks, each with its own door. This is from Gordon's journal entry on the day Braddock arrived at Fort Cumberland. Gordon estimates the fort size as 600 by 138 feet. This is radically different from Loudermilk's 400 by 160 foot estimate. When I scale drawing 38, I get 412 by 165 feet. Either somebody's estimate is wrong or the fort was enlarged by the time Gordon saw it. Drawing 38 says the fort is nine feet tall and made of puncheons. Gordon says it is 12 feet tall and made with logs. Drawing 38 is a carefully prepared architectural drawing. Gordon was a military engineer. So who are you going to believe? Gordon is in the minority. Later, someone else describes the stockade walls as being about nine feet tall. I doubt that an engineer would get the height wrong by three feet. I suspect that some part of the fortification actually had 12 foot walls. Gordon provides other details. He stated that his outfit camped west of the fort on a hill. He stated that the fort has embrasures for 12 guns and 10 mounted, four pounders, besides stocks for swivels and loopholes for small arms. Drawings 38 and 39 show that the 12 embrasures were in the bastions. This is what a four pound cannonball looks like, and that's me holding it. It's pretty easy to hit a big fort with an itty bitty smoothbore cannon. It's a lot harder to try and hit that itty bitty cannon from the fort. This is the May 11th entry from the Siemens Journal. The Siemens Journal and Gordon's Journal are just different versions of the same document. I think one of them was massaged a little bit for public consumption. The fort is 18 feet narrower in this journal compared to the Gordon Journal. One or the other must have a transcription error. The journal states that embrasures are cut for 12 guns, which are four pounders, though 10 are only mounted with loopholes for small arms. This is an awkward sentence. There were embrasures for cannons. There were also loopholes for small arms. Although the fort had 12 embrasures, there were only 10 cannons. The cannons were mounted in the bastions. The two empty embrasures probably faced into the barracks stockade area. Embrasures are small openings in a wall for the muzzle of a gun. The openings are small to make it harder to shoot the gunners. This is from the April 27th entry in Braddock's orderly book. It mentions a bridge over Wills Creek. Maybe the bridge was not yet finished, but this is the earliest reference to a bridge at Cumberland, Maryland that I have found. The Siemens Journal indicates that the Indian camp was a quarter mile from the fort. It states the Indian houses are composed of two stakes, drove into the ground with a ridge pole and bark of trees laid down the sides of it. 
Here's what that looks like. Gordon's journal says the camp was near some woods. This is from the Gordon journal. A new magazine, a boat, and a bridge over Wills Creek were under construction on May 21st. Gordon also mentions blacksmiths and bakers. Considering the large number of men at Fort Cumberland, where did all the butchering and cooking take place? Put forges and bake ovens and butchering scaffolds in your mental picture of Fort Cumberland. On May 24th, there were 2,290 men at Fort Cumberland. Where did they all sleep? Where did they eat? How did they store their water? Where did they go to the bathroom? The large timber referenced here was probably for the new bridge or the magazine. The last of Braddock's forces left Fort Cumberland on June 10th, 1755. This is from Nurse Brown's diary. Her barracks room had a single firing port and the walls were unchinked. It's safe to assume that every outside room had a firing port. Braddock's forces were defeated at the Battle of Monongahela on July 9th, 1755. The news reached Fort Cumberland on July 11th and survivors started arriving at the fort on July 15th. The mid-1755 Gordon map shows a stockade around the new store. Dunbar indicates that the four-pounders at Fort Cumberland had ship carriages with iron wheels and weighed 12 to 1,300 pounds. Here is a cannon mounted on a ship carriage with iron wheels. It would not be very easy to shift your aim sideways. This old ship carriage is rotting away at the Naval Academy which is near my house. Adam Stephen wrote this on October 4th. He described organized genocide that was taking place in the neighborhood. Because of the constant danger, they are digging a well at the fort. That well still exists, but it is located underneath a blacktop parking lot. The well was rediscovered in 1961. At the time, it was 52 feet deep. In 1878, Loudermilk wrote that the well was about 80 feet deep. John Widener's father was there when part of a gun carriage, a wheel, and a large quantity of cannon and musket balls were cleaned out of the well. That was about 1799. In 1933, a college student wrote that the remains of the well may still be seen on the property of Dr. Johnson. The well still exists, it's just covered up with blacktop. That's the Emanuel Episcopal Church on the right. The red dot I added to this 1904 map identifies the approximate location of the well. Captain Lewis wrote this on October 26th. He reports 13 cannons at Fort Cumberland. 11 are four pounders and two are smaller. He estimates the fort at 100 feet square. This is probably a curtain to curtain estimate. Adam Stephen wrote this to George Washington on January 31, 1756. He mentions a new house at Fort Cumberland. The next day, Washington wrote back. He told Stephen not to erect any buildings that weren't absolutely necessary. Colonel Innes sent this to the Fort Major at Fort Cumberland on May 26, 1756. It mentions a row of barracks next to the Potomac facing the new store. These barracks aren't on the drawings. He had to describe which row of barracks he was referring to. This suggests that there was more than one row outside the fort. The letter mentions houses and huts on the river bottom and near the garrison. These were to be rented out if they weren't being used by the military. How's that for unexpected? You could rent a house at Fort Cumberland in 1756. Dowder Milk wrote, quite a number of log houses for barracks were built near the crest and as far back as Smallwood Street, but these were made use of only when there was present a greater force than could be accommodated in the fort 
and the barracks immediately adjoining. This is tradition rather than evidence. Although I don't know the basis for Loudermilk's statement, I know he was alive during the lifetime of Nancy Miller. She would have heard stories from the oldest town residents. This is an English version of a French intelligence report. It optimistically states that the English dug a ditch to bury their cannon. There were a lot of reasons for ditches at forts. For example, they could be used for latrines or for burial of waste from the butchering process or for drainage. Ditches are called trenches when they are used for defensive fighting positions. If you're being shot at, Mother Earth is your best friend. People lived outside the fort. If they were attacked, it sure would be nice to have a trench to dive into and fight from. While we do not know what the ditches were for that the French observed, we can adjust our mental picture of the fort to include ditches. Bob Bance told me you could smell a fort long before you saw it. When I think of all the garbage and latrines and animal guts and hides from butchering, I believe it. This is from George Washington's July 6 orders. The quartermaster is to take a man per company and see the streets between the barracks well cleaned, the bog houses cleaned, and all the filth and garbage near the fort carried off. All non-commissioned officers and soldiers are expressly ordered to wear their hair. Let's dissect this. It tells us there are streets between the barracks. The bog houses are, are latrines. There's filth and garbage that needs hauled away. Oh, and one last thing. Everybody has to wear their wigs. George Washington wrote this on September 23rd. Fort Cumberland must be fortified with strong works or else it will inevitably fall garrison and stores into the enemy's hands. This led to major structural changes to the fort. Governor Sharp wrote this in September. He describes the weakness of the fort. He wrote that it is made with staccatos only and commanded almost on every side by circumjacent hills. In other words, the fort was indefensible from any cannon fire coming from the nearby hills. A council of war was held to decide whether to keep Fort Cumberland. The report is rich with information. It says the stockades are about nine feet high and incapable of defense against artillery. It says the fort is commanded by higher ground to the northwest. It says the fort is commanded by other hills within cannon range. For example, the fort was only 360 yards from the hill at Ridgely. It says the barracks outside the fort are easily set on fire. It says the enemy can sneak up on them, hidden and protected by the banks of Wills Creek and the Potomac. It says the fort has no water except the river and creek. That means the well was not yet finished. It mentions that a tunnel to the creek can't be depended on unless strongly defended. Although not mentioned here, another problem was the danger from inaccurate long range small arms fire coming from nearby hills. This is a tunnel that comes out from underneath the Emanuel Episcopal Church. The exit of the tunnel is on the steep bank that is located between the church and Wills Creek. The tunnel is believed to be a surviving element of Fort Cumberland. Other earthen and masonry features under the church are also thought to be surviving elements of the fort. These are conclusions from the Council of War. Stephen wants orders to continue strengthening the fort. He mentions a redoubt that could be pulled down and mentions erecting a different defense in another location. The redoubt may be the gun platform on the hill northwest of the fort. Bowdermilk provides a clue regarding the placement of the platform. He wrote, the ground to the northwest was somewhat higher, but a small earthwork of a temporary character was constructed on the crest, on the site of the residence of the late James W. Jones. 
George Washington added comments to the report. One of his comments states, as to the works, they are already well described as quite insufficient to resist a common swivel and must require new improvement if continued. On November 16, 1756, Dinwiddie ordered Washington to make the fort as strong as he can. This is from an undated document that is titled, Address of the Officers of the Virginia Regiment. I think it was written after October 6. It says they have been busy adding new works to Fort Cumberland. The objective was to make the fort more defensible. Adam Stephen wrote this on December 6th. He states, we have erected a sort of raveling on the north side of the fort, one face fronting the hill, the other that of the valley on the east side of Wills Creek. The rampart is brought almost to a level with the hill, is about 20 feet thick, the parapet six feet high and of the same thickness. In the angle of the ravelin, I have built a magazine, proof against small shells, and has out a way underground to the water of Wills Creek. Governor Dinwiddie has given orders to continue the work. The ravelin radically altered the appearance of the fort. It was a 20-foot thick structure that was located outside the fort to protect the fort from any cannon fire coming from the northwest. It consisted of two walls joined at an acute angle and had outward facing fighting positions on top. A magazine was located between the walls. There was also an underground passage to allow water to be fetched from Wills Creek. This is from a drawing attributed to George Washington. That V-shaped structure is the Revlin. It was 20 feet thick and filled with dirt. The acute corner looks like the corner of an ancient fortification at Dubrovnik, Croatia, that is known as the Revlin. Stefan said the rampart was 20 feet thick. A rampart is a defensive wall with a broad top and a walkway. The 20 foot thickness is illustrated here. Stefan said the Revlin was nearly level with the hill. The hill was 31 feet higher than the ground at the fort. Stefan said the parapet was six feet high and as thick as the rampart. A parapet is a low protective wall along the periphery of a rampart. If the wall was the same thickness as a rampart, does that even make sense? Here is an overview of Washington's sketch of the situation at Fort Cumberland. North is toward the top. We'll zoom in now and take a look at various details. Here we are zoomed in to look at the two roads to Fort Duquesne. North is still generally toward the top of the page. Have a look at the roads. The right hand fork that crosses Wills Creek is Spendalow's Road. It went through the Narrows and then followed Braddock Run. The left hand fork passed over Haystack Mountain. The road to Virginia crosses Wills Creek, generally east of Fort Cumberland. Here we are zoomed in on the bend in the Potomac River. North is still at the top of the page. We can see the new store, the blockhouse, and another building on the Virginia side of the river. Here I have rotated the map and zoomed in close enough to see the firing ports on the blockhouse. We can also see the windows, door, and chimney on the new store. Count the windows. The new store was a substantial building for that time and place. Now imagine it with a stockade, like the Gordon map illustrates. The Revlin may have looked something roughly like this. This is a very crude mock-up and not worth looking at for more than a few seconds. George Washington was not thrilled about strengthening Fort Cumberland. When he got in that kind of a mood, he found clever ways to express himself. His December 19th letter to Dinwiddie is an example. He wrote, 
I should have been exceedingly glad if your honor and the council had directed in what manner Fort Cumberland is to be strengthened, i.e., whether it is to be made cannon proof or not, and that you would fix the sum beyond which we shall not go. For I must look to you for the expense, knowing that the country has already rejected some articles of this. Despite this letter, he followed his orders and set about making Fort Cumberland defensible. Dinwiddie responded to Washington. He said not to make the fort cannon proof unless it can be done cheaply. On January 12, 1757, Washington wrote back, stating, We have as many men at work here, preparing timber to strengthen the works, as tools will supply. But I wish I had been ordered to build a new fort altogether, rather than attempt to repair the old one. This is an English translation of a February 13, 1758 letter that was written from Montreal. It describes what a French spy reported. It states, M. de Rochebleve, on his last reconnoitering trip, approached very near Fort Cumberland. He saw that the English had built, on the outside, two redoubts in which they had placed batteries of cannon, and that they were also building a fort with the logs laid lengthwise around the stockaded fort. This is fascinating stuff. The British were building a fort around Fort Cumberland using horizontal logs. They had also added two redoubts that featured batteries of cannons. Now we get to another interesting drawing. Here I have it rotated so that the north arrow points toward the left. Don't believe the arrow. It really points northwest. This drawing was made before Braddock's expedition. It was captured at Braddock's defeat. It was probably modified by the French to show the Ravelin and other modifications. In other words, it probably shows what their spies reported. I rotated the drawing on the right to approximately match the terrain features A, B, and C on the topographic map. It's not perfect because the drawing was not made to perfect scale. The letters A, B, and C identify hills where the enemy could plant cannon and fire on the fort. The Revlin, which is shown on the drawing on the right, was designed to protect the fort from cannon fire coming from the hill that is marked C. The roads to Fort Duquesne are also shown in blue on the topographic map. Here is an inscription in French that was added to the drawing by the French captain de Moss. The inscription states, found in the military cache of General Braddock along with plans and instructions, 10th July 1755. Captain Dumas. This is an enlarged view of the fort. The Revelin faces northwest to defend against any cannon fire coming from the hill that was labeled C. Something is drawn around the fort that is about the same thickness as the Revelin. I interpret this to represent the 20-foot thick earthworks that are described in other documents. Those earthworks were added to protect the fort from cannon fire. I interpret the dashed lines outside the earthworks as representing a dry ditch that is mentioned in another document. The ditch formed an obstacle and provided dirt for the earthworks. Here is another inscription on the drawing. As best I can read it, it states, South Gate weak, two twelves here, two nines on the others, barracks for 750 men, guns stored on the southeast casemate, southeast angle, five houses for Indian traders, trail lead to Duquesne, Portage of Scow, not 25 yards. Hilly ground and marshy. Two field pieces. Two howitzers. 
to cohorn. A cohorn is a mortar and fires in a high and arching trajectory. A casemate is a small room with firing ports that is built into the thick wall of a fort. Now we are zoomed in on the bend of the Potomac River. Five houses are numbered. There is also a building without a number. The new store and the blockhouse are labeled. Lines on the drawing show that the blockhouse and the new store are vulnerable to close range cannon fire from the Maryland side of the river. Lines also show that Fort Cumberland is vulnerable from the same firing position. At the top, you can see the road to Virginia crossing Wills Creek. That crossing site was sometimes bridged, but sometimes the bridge washed out. George Washington wrote these to Dinwiddie. They document a bridge that was completed by July 21st, 1757. The bridge would have been across Wills Creek. Thomas Barton wrote this at Fort Cumberland on September 7th. It is worth reading in its entirety. He wrote, I spent next day in viewing the place. The situation is pleasant enough, almost quite surrounded with high mountains. Upon a rising ground in the fork of Potomac and Wills Creek stands the fort, which is a trifling piece of work. It was originally a square stockade of a hundred feet with four bastions, but so ill put up and the timber so small that General Braddock declared he could make a better with rotten apples. Since his time, some improvements have been made. On the outside of the stockade, a sort of battery has lately been added, which covers about three sides of the fort. It is made of square logs filled with earth about 20 feet thick and 12 high, with a dry ditch not finished. There are 10 embrasures with an iron four pounder planted in each. It is so irregular that I believe trigonometry cannot give it a name. No part of it will defend the other, and I heard a judicious gentleman say he would rather fight with 50 men out of it than with a 100 in it. If it is designed as a defense against cannon, the spot where it stands is ill chose, for about 300 yards northwest of it is a fine hill which entirely commands it. And in my opinion, here should be the fort. About 400 yards south-southwest of it is another hill on the Virginia side of the Potomac, from whence it might easily be annoyed. On the top of this hill is a large storehouse built by the Ohio Company, which at present serves as a hospital, and here a guard of 30 men is kept, who pass and repass the Potomac. Barton described 20 foot thick earthworks on about three sides of the fort that were held together with squared timbers. He also describes a dried ditch. In my opinion, those things are shown on the drawing we just looked at. Barton also describes several fine fenced in vegetable gardens on the banks of the river, about 40 yards from the fort. There were 3,277 barrels of flour at Fort Cumberland on September 15, 1758. I mentioned this to help you visualize the capacity of the storehouses. On September 27th, an explosion occurred near the Grand Magazine. This burst the door open on the powder magazine and set the fort on fire in at least two places. The Grand Powder Magazine was inside the Northwest Bastion. I included this letter because it says a storehouse blew up at Fort Cumberland. The newspaper article in the previous slide called it the Inward Magazine. The words were sometimes interchangeable.
This September 30 letter mentions a storehouse outside the fort and a lesser magazine. It says the buckshot in the lesser magazine was destroyed. This letter mentions a new storehouse that was located under the hill. Governor Sharp was looking for spare wheels and discovered 15 or 16 wagons in a storehouse. Imagine how big that storehouse was. This image of a British artillery ammunition wagon is from the book A Treatise on Artillery that was published in London in 1757. Although this may not be the exact style of the artillery wagons Governor Sharp found in a storehouse at Fort Cumberland, it should give us a general sense of the size of artillery wagons from that era. The front wheels are four feet in diameter and the rear wheels are five feet in diameter. The Indian trader James Kenney wrote this in 1759. He made reservations to rent a house at Fort Cumberland before arriving there. James Kenney's journal entry for February 21st, 1759, indicates that one end of the bridge over Wills Creek had washed away and was repaired. This is about a month later on March 29th. Kenney mentions more than one bridge on Wills Creek being swept away by floodwaters. He also mentions three families living in houses along the river. Captain Paris decided to try to make a floodproof bridge across Wills Creek. The length of the proposed bridge was 270 feet. There were to be six 12 by 24 foot stone filled pillars having a height of 20 feet. Paris also described two canoes at the fort. The large canoe was 29 feet long and the small canoe was 20 feet long. This transcript shows the size of the bridge and the canoes and the shape of the bridge pillars. Sometimes there were large herds and wagon trains at Fort Cumberland. In your mental picture of the fort, keep a place for five or 600 head of cattle or sheep, large numbers of pack horses, and significant numbers of wagons and wagon horses. On August 22nd, 1759, Mercer said the storehouses were in bad shape. He reported that it looked like they had been torn up for firewood. He ordered that they be repaired. In the same letter, Mercer said that two sawyers were required for sawing planks. This mid-1700s drawing shows how logs were sawn into planks. Two September 1759 letters reference repairing the fort and storehouses. Enough storehouses were repaired by November 26th, and a new boat had been made for crossing the Potomac River. The December 10th report says the fort has 10 cannons. The Ohio Company decided to hire someone to repair the new store on October 17, 1760. Later, in 1778, they reported that their buildings had been dismantled to build barracks at the fort. They also reported that the timber had been taken for a mile around to make public buildings and barrels. The letter at the top indicates that Fort Cumberland was constructed with double logs and earth. Wooden cribs were probably retained with cross ties to resist the lateral force of the dirt fill. The original stockade would be poorly suited for resisting this lateral force. How extensive were the earthworks? Did they only encompass the fort 
or did they also encompass the stockade barracks? Jesse Corns, who was born in 1809, provides a clue. He played on the earthworks as a child and reports they extended 40 feet east of Emanuel Church. That means they encompassed at least the eastern end of the barracks stockade. Louder Milk's book tells us that the lot where Emanuel Church stands was described as being in the fort in 1817. This suggests that the lot was flanked by earthworks that were still obvious in 1817. In turn, this seems to put earthworks around the barracks part of the fortification. Fort Cumberland received an extra cannon and four additional swivels in February of 1762. The brass cannon was at Fort Cumberland in 1755 and appeared to be a Spanish piece. Colonel Iyer's journal entry from April of 1762 is very informative. Fort Cumberland was going to ruin. Two curtains had been damaged by the explosion and were never repaired. The other curtains were pretty open. The fort had 11 cannons. There were a vast number of disassembled wagons in outer storehouses. The Ohio Company was building a new storehouse across the river. This is the text of a 1763 Ohio Company advertisement. They were hoping to sell lots in a town they were trying to form at Fort Cumberland. They called the town Charlottesburg. Pontiac's War ended the project. They offered to rent two brand new two-story storehouses in Virginia that had basements. One storehouse was 25 by 45 feet and the other was 20 by 44 feet, a stable for 12 horses, a summer kitchen, a smokehouse, a barn, and two boats were all part of the deal. George Mercer's 1763 notes from the town survey mention a wagon road to Pittsburgh, a main street, a cleared field, a garden, the bridge ford on Wills Creek, a storehouse for artillery wagons, the new storehouse, the north bastion of Fort Cumberland, Braddock's Wagon Road, the powder magazine of the fort, a chimney, and a location where mills were supposed to go. This photo shows a log building that is 25 foot wide and 30 foot long. The Ohio Company storehouses were 50% longer than this building. One was 44 feet long and the other was 45 feet long. One of them had the same width as this building and one was 20% narrower. In 1763, James Kenney reported that a man named Martin was repairing the old Ohio Company storehouse and building a new one. The upper letter, written on June 9, 1763, indicates that Fort Cumberland was now defendable. The lower letter explains how it was accomplished. Sixty or seventy refugees helped to stockade part of the old fort. Finally, the damage from the magazine explosion was repaired. In July of 1764, McIntosh reported that the fort and barracks were in disrepair and untenable. The barracks were so bad they could not be used unless they were repaired. On September 24th, Seeley reported that the fort had been repaired in the best manner it would admit. The upper letter, which was written in 1764, is a milestone in Fort Cumberland history. It is the earliest known reference to a tavern and a civilian store at Fort Cumberland. The bottom letter references the same storekeeper three months later. 
Traditions abound of settlers coming to Fort Cumberland for supplies. Enoch Ennis ran the store. The upper letter says the fort was repaired with fascines. Fascines are bundles of light wood like saplings. They're used to shore up earthen ramparts. The use of fascines was a military engineering art. An 1855 military dictionary has over a page of definitions for fascine related words. The upper letter states that there are eight families living at the fort. It also states that the barracks were being put in good order. I believe the fascines were used in place of logs to hold the fort earthworks in position. This drawing shows how fascines are used to shore up an earthen rampart. This was the last known phase of Fort Cumberland construction. Fort Cumberland was abandoned in 1765. Charles Mason reported that it was in bad repair in June of 1766, but still had 10 cannons. In 1775, Cresswell described the fort as deserted and demolished. Six cannons were still there in good working order. When Samuel Vaughn visited Cumberland in 1787, he mentions the remains of an earthen fort. In his 1833 book, Samuel Kershaval said that the remains of Fort Cumberland could still be seen, although on the ancient site of the fort there were several dwelling houses and a new brick Episcopal church. The upper text is from an 1857 article in Harper's Monthly. It states, on Green Street, there are two houses said to have been built by Braddock, constructed of stout timber, heavily ironed and riveted on both sides. One, from the manner in which its doors are made, is supposed to have been a jail. The other, a two-story log and weather-boarded edifice, still goes by the name of Braddock's Court. The history of these two buildings is tradition rather than provable fact. Louder Milk's book reports that the alleged jail had no windows and the door was thickly studded with nails. You probably know that Washington's forces rendezvoused at Fort Cumberland in 1794 during the Whiskey Rebellion. This is a painting that depicts the event what you may not know is that Fort Cumberland was a busy supply depot for the Western Department during the Revolution. The British even had two separate plans to attack Fort Cumberland. The Revolutionary War history is fascinating, but that's another story for another day. You probably know the Washington's headquarters tradition that says his headquarters was part of Fort Cumberland during the French and Indian War. My book Fort Cumberland debunks that tradition and explains that the cabin was Washington's headquarters during the Whiskey Rebellion. Loudermilk tells us where the cabin used to stand. It was moved in the 1840s and returned to Cumberland in 1921. The right-hand image shows a fragment from Washington's headquarters that was presented to me when I gave the original version of this lecture in 2019. The left-hand photo shows me standing in front of Washington's headquarters on the same day. This is the end of the presentation. I hope it helps you visualize what Fort Cumberland was like and how it changed over time. This presentation is primarily based on material from my 2019 book, Fort Cumberland. The book is available in a two-volume print format from various online booksellers. It is also available in Kindle format from Amazon. All proceeds benefit the Allegheny County Historical Society.